Hello and welcome back. Here we're going to be talking a little bit about several different strategies that we think about when we're trying to address non-communicable diseases. So we'll start off by talking a little bit about multiple risk factors. So when we think about non-communicable diseases, there are actually a range of different things that could potentially be causing them. And we can look, you know, both within uh, at the self level, the family level, community level, or society level. And actually understanding how those different factors relate can actually help us to identify the multiple risks that combine to increase risk for disease. Because very often it isn't just a single thing, it's multiple things working in combination. So, um, so this again is, is helpful for risk stratification. So the idea is, is as we get more information about the different components of risk that people have, um, then we can actually help stratify risk to find people who are who um, who we can target resources to. So <clears throat> it's particularly useful when we see that certain risk cluster for uh, a certain population. So uh, there might be some identifying factor for them that we can see that, you know, multiple risk factors at work, and we can work directly with that population to help them uh, in their community. Okay. So something to know about these multiple risk factors that you can have is that they can be additive or multiplicative. So in some cases, uh, if you have one risk and another risk, you just add those risks together and you get the combination of those two risks, okay? Another possibility is if you have one risk and you have another risk, you might actually multiply them by one another. You might actually, it might actually be that the two are, it's not just the addition of those two, but it's a multiplicative effect. So, so it's actually much higher if you have two risks at the same time, okay? So um, that's the way biology works sometimes, is that uh, if you are impacting things from two directions, it actually is much worse than just the two separate risks uh, independently, okay? So here's an example of multiple ri uh, risk factors uh, as expressed through the Framingham Heart Study. So the Framingham Heart Study was a study that was done in Framingham, Massachusetts with um, uh, essentially a, a set population where they studied them over many, many years. It's been going on for well over 50 years. And um, what they found is that if you look at individual risk factors, so BMI over 27, whether or not people smoke, um, total cholesterol over 220, uh, diabetes and hypertension, right? If you look at each of those, it's about slightly above uh, an odds ratio of one, all right? So the black line is one, which means that essentially no effect, all right? So you see that each of those is a risk factor for uh, for heart heart disease, but most of them are not that, that great, okay? Now, what we find is for those factors is that there's actually a multiplicative effect. So if you combine them, if, as you can see in the bottom, if you combine smoking and BMI, uh, that actually goes up to, to two, all right? If you combine uh, all four, uh, all five of those different factors together in the same one, then we go up to an odds ratio of about, um, sorry, uh, actually for smoking and BMI, it goes up to about a two point, uh, th about three, um, which is more than both uh, added together. Um, and then uh, if you look at things where, you, where people who have all of those different risk factors, it goes up to an odds ratio of about 14, which is a really high risk for that disease, uh, for developing heart disease. So the combination of those factors sometimes produce an impact, which is much greater than those, those factors themselves. All right, that's, that's the overall point here. So if we as uh, public health workers can identify that there's a specific group of people or a certain population that has many of these different risk factors together, then we know that they're much more likely to develop a disease and we can target more of our resources to them. Um, so it's a, it's a helpful strategy for thinking about uh, 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 intervention development. All right, I also want to talk to you a little bit about public health genetics. So public health genetics or public health genomics is something that's actually my field. That's something that I care a lot about. It's really a field trying to understand how 
genetics and genetic information can be used in public health. Okay. So we know that uh, when it comes to risks, that um, <clears throat> that uh, environmental factors play a substantial role in health-related risks. However, if you actually do studies, um, you actually find that uh, for many of these non-communicable diseases, genetics plays a, a bit, really big role in how likely people are to develop a disease or not. Uh, so heart disease, for example, estimates suggest that uh, about 30% uh, to 50% of your risk for heart disease is due to uh, genetic risks that you've inherited. Uh, for obesity, uh, body weight, uh, it's about 70% uh, is a genetic component. And for those, you know, there's stereotypes around pe body weight being something that's a choice or because people are, you know, not motivated to take on action. Well, the vast majority of this risk is, uh, and, and people's characteristics are, are due to genetics, right? So it's not a choice. It's not uh, very much... To a large extent, it's not due to behaviors in, in many ways. Uh, behaviors are important and they're a component to this, but uh, the variation that we see in the society is primarily not due to, uh, due to uh, behaviors, it's primarily due to genetic factors. Uh, then we have things like lung cancer. Lung cancer is an example of a factor where there is a genetic component to risk, but most of your risk for lung cancer is actually due to whether or not you smoke. So uh, actually that's one where the genetic component is very small. If suddenly we stopped smoking, uh, we stopped smoking entirely and stopped using things that might cause lung cancer, while the percentage that's caused by genetics comparatively might go up substantially. But at this point, it's only about 8%. Uh, type two diabetes, uh, a quarter, I've actually seen uh, estimates up to about 50% for type two diabetes risk from genetics. Alzheimer's disease is actually really quite high. Um, uh, um, 60 to, to 80 percent of your risk from for, for is genetics. There's some risk factors where you're about have about 10 times average risk if you have those certain genetic traits, APOE4, uh, which is a certain gene that increases your risk. And depression is also one where there's a large genetic component where it's uh, largely inherited. So the point being here that there is uh, a large genetic component to a lot of non-communicable diseases. So we th when we think about these common diseases, which again are the big public health, uh, big hitters when it comes to public health impacts, uh, major impact on uh, financially and in terms of mortality for uh, U.S. society, uh, we often think of these uh, environmental behavioral factors as being what we should focus in on in public health. And historically, most of our public health interventions have been focused on those things because we see them as being the things that we can actually change. Right? We can get people to exercise, we can get people to change their diet, we can get people to change their exposure to toxins. Um, but as I've mentioned here before, actually a lot of your risk for diseases is actually associated with DNA and genetics. So in theory, uh, knowing those risks might actually be helpful. Now, uh, if we know that people are at greater risk for a disease, maybe we could target more resources to them to help them change their behaviors, for example, and prevent those diseases. So it's an interesting idea that knowledge of genetic risks might actually be useful in public health interventions. So there are a few different uh, genetic interventions that are actually incredibly common. I often ask my classes when I teach a, a genetics course, how many of you have actually had a genetic test? And only a few people raise their hand. Um, the truth is, is that almost everybody in our class, in a class has had a genetic test. And that's because a standard public health procedure is called newborn screening. And by law, uh, states actually screen newborns for a wide range of different genetic disorders. Uh, to determine whether or not they might be at risk. Because these are genetic disorders that if we target treatment early on, that it act can actually have a major impact in terms of uh, preventing disability for, the, for those uh, newborns or perhaps, perhaps death. So by knowing those things, uh, it's, it's actually quite helpful. And most states use a panel of about 34 or more of these genetic tests to assess uh, newborns based upon their risks. And it's an interesting sort of standard public health intervention, happens to almost all, all, all newborns. 
and uh, they they do the tests when when they're born, and they get it done within a f the first couple of days of life, so that they can target that prevention really early on. So, um, standard public health prevention effort. Okay. Another thing is family health histories. So whenever you go to, into the clinic, they ask you about your family health history, and it turns out that family health history is a very effective way of learning about people's risk for disease. So. Um, if you have a first degree relative for heart disease, um, you have about three to five times the normal risk of developing heart disease, for example. For type 2 diabetes, it's around five as well. Um, a lot of these common health conditions, if you find out how many people in your family have that disease, you, you can actually have a, a pretty good risk estimate for your likelihood of develop, developing these common diseases. So another really helpful tool that's used clinically and can be used in public health interventions too. Um, so uh, increasingly we're having the ability to, to actually measure genetic risks. So sometimes we uh, do genetic prevention, which is uh, uh, one strategy. Uh, this is testing uh, uh, before uh, people are born. And this is a very controversial strategy, of course, uh, but uh, sometimes people make decisions about whether to go forward with a pregnancy if they find out that a child has a, a substantial risk for a genetic disorder um, or is, is going to develop that genetic disorder. So that's a one thing that's way that genetic information is used. Um, another way is uh, if you know that you, you might have a genetic risk factor that's been passed to you, onto you through your family, and uh, you're at much higher risk to get a disease, or you might actually go be going to have that disease. And uh, what you can sometimes do is you can sometimes take action to prevent that disease from happening, or, or you can do screening to detect that disease before it gets really bad. For example, if you have uh, the BRCA1 and 2 mutation where you have about a, a really high risk of developing breast cancer, sometimes people take action, uh, 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 preventative mastectomies, for example, to prevent that disease from occurring. Um, then there's uh, gene environment interaction. So sometimes by knowing that people have certain genetic risks, you can actually prevent them from having uh, being exposed to certain environmental factors, toxins, for example, that might have major impacts on them. And then there's this large, larger idea of doing a large genome-based detection of, of risk factors where people might have be determined to have a uh, they might have not have a really high chance of developing a disease, but it might be marginally elevated risks. So the idea that we can identify these susceptibilities to disease and actually prevent, uh, help people change their behavior or change their risk to prevent it from occurring. So some fairly exciting interventions. Now for non-communicable diseases, we're learning a lot. You know, this is really a progressing all these different areas are, are progressing. So a lot, a lot of different factors in heart disease where we have some knowledge of risk factors and, and elements uh, in terms of that cause, but sometimes that isn't entirely clarified. Um, and in terms of our interventions for dealing with it, well, we, we, there's still a lot of research that needs to be done to understand how to address non communicable diseases. And there's some really exciting work being done out there. For example, there's some work being done around uh, vaccines for cancers. Uh, that have been incredibly promising that um, we might see in the next decade that we have vaccines that actually can kill cancers uh, as they're developed, um, which should be much more effective than many of the strategies that we have now, including surgeries, right? So um, there, uh, there are um, some really promising things coming down the pipeline. And I, I think that's really important to keep updated on what's going on with new research. For example, um, I, I post to, to uh, my, my website, the Teaching Public Health Facebook group, uh, new, new articles all the time that I'm really interested in making sure that my students know about because it's important to keep updated on new information that's coming out. So something that I take seriously, and if you're interested in uh, pursuing a, a career in health, it's really important to make sure that you're uh, staying up to date. All right, so thank you very much for listening. These are just a few different things to think about when we think about how we would address common health uh, non-communicable diseases. And uh, they can be actually quite effective uh, and have a lot of promise for, uh, for future strategies for improving public health interventions. So thank you very much for listening and take care.